Hello everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight for our lecture. We'll go ahead and get started in about five minutes. Hi everyone, thanks for joining us tonight. We will go ahead and get started in about three minutes. Hi everyone, we still see some folks jumping on, so we'll get started here in about two minutes or so. Hi everyone, thanks for joining. We'll go ahead and get moving here in about a minute or so.
Hello, and thank you for joining us for this month's public lecture. My name is Amelia, and I'm going to be your host and moderator tonight. As usual, we have some announcements before we get to our speaker and to give you all a chance to get settled before we get started. First off, this month marks our one year anniversary of bringing the lecture series to you in a virtual format. Thank you to all of you who continue to join and support the series. Next month, on April 24th at 6 p.m. Pacific time, we will have USGS ecologist Justin Welty, who will be giving his lecture titled, A Burning Question, What Can Long-Term Datasets Teach Us? Now, for those of you who are joining us for the very first time, and you're watching this through your desktop and need to find the closed captions for this talk, they are loaded, they're located at the bottom right hand corner of your screen and you can click on the closed caption icon with the two letter C's. And lastly, toward the end of our talk, we will open it up to the Q&A session. To submit your question, just click on the question mark icon located toward the upper right hand corner of your screen. And now it's time to introduce you to our speaker. Joining us is Dr. M Matt Kaufman. Matt leads the scientific team at the University of Wyoming and the USGS that has broken new ground exploring the long distance migrations of Wyoming's large ungulates and communicating their importance to the public. His research seeks to understand how and why ungulates migrate by evaluating the role of forage, movement, fat dynamics, reproduction, and survival. Increasingly, he has sought to understand how the persistence of ungulate migration is threatened by landscape change. In 2012, Matt co-founded and now directs the Wyoming Migration Initiative, which you can visit the website at migrationinitiative.org, whose mission is to advance the understanding and appreciation and conservation of Wyoming's migratory ungulates. Since 2006, Matt has worked at the USGS research with the Wyoming Cooperative Fish and Wildlife Research Unit as a faculty in the Department of Zoology and Physiology at the University of Wyoming. In 2010, he assumed leadership of the Wyoming Co-op Unit. Without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to Matt, who will be talking about hoofing it in the West, conservation challenges and solutions for big migratory game. Matt, thank you for being here. I will now hand it off over to you. Great, thanks Amelia and thanks Christy. Uh, I think thanks to you both for all the legwork to get things set up. I'm gonna see if I can share things appropriately. Okay, you gonna give me a thumbs up that you got my, uh, you give me a thumb that you got my talk there, okay. And give me one more moment here. Sorry, I don't quite have the controls working just yet. Okay, great. Well, uh, welcome everybody and thanks for um, joining my talk this evening. I'm going to kind of walk you through work that we've been doing on ungulate migrations for about the last uh, 10 or 12 years. And, um, and it's going to kind of go from ecology and some discoveries we've had into some of the, um, the outreach work we've done and some of the conservation work that we're doing and uh, especially work that we're doing across the West um, over the last couple of years. So I'm going to jump right in um, with this video of pronghorn, um, which I think sort of demonstrate one of the benefits of migration. These animals are moving in the early winter. They're moving out of their high elevation summer range across the Grovant Mountains down to their low elevation winter range. And this is, of course, one of the benefits of migration that allows animals to live in multiple places across the seasons. Um, Right now, we're kind of undergoing a renaissance in, in uh, our study of ungulate migration, especially with the ability to, um, to collar animals and get detailed loc uh, location information. 
So for me, um, some of my early work started with uh, this map, actually. This is a map of a mule deer migrating in the Sierra Madre Mountains of southern Wyoming. And you can see all of its points piled up here on winter range, and then it makes this migration up to summer range in the mountains. And what uh, I was looking at this map with my uh, PhD student, Hal Sawyer, and what we noticed was all of these these points, uh, these these parts of the migration where these points are piling up, and hopefully you can see that on your screen. These are these are places where the deer is spending one, two, three days, even a week, not migrating at all, but stopped over. And this was really curious to us why the deer wouldn't just um, move all the way, you know, straight up to summer range in a more rapid fashion. And we had the idea that perhaps what was going on here is that this was the deer responding to um, the green up of the forage. And so for ungulates, um, they seek out a low fiber diet. And that's because plants that are low in fiber are easy to digest and they can quickly convert them to fat. So unlike us, we're looking for high fiber diets, most of us, because um, that, that, that allows us to put on less fat and, um, and, and of course, it's really hard to digest that high fiber. But ungulates are trying to put on fat for the growing season. And as plants grow, they start out in this low fiber state. And you can think of this as like the spring salad mix that you go to the, the grocery store to get. And then, then as they continue to grow and, and put, on, um, put on height so they can leaf out, and flower, they put on cell walls and that's where the fiber comes from. So we've known this for a while that animals are searching out these, these low fiber, early emergent plants. And we thought maybe this is what's going on with the mule deer. Maybe this is why they're stopping over. So this, um, it, it turns out this idea has a name, it's called the green wave hypothesis. And it was first put forward by uh, waterfowl biologists. And I, I love this quote from Drent et al. And from 1978, um, it seems reasonable to suggest that by making the northward shift, the geese are riding the crest of the wave as it concerns digestibility. And so what he's talking about is that as these geese migrate um, to northern latitudes, you can sort of see it here, um, as they're, they're migrating, they're always sort of catching spring and getting that early, the same, you know, these are herbivores as well, and getting that, that early uh, the young emergent plants, which are easy for them to, to digest. So this is referred to the green wave hypothesis. And so our first step was to do a kind of crude test of the green wave hypothesis. And so I'm just going to show you that here. So this is that, that same kind of migration from winter range, stopping over in these red areas to summer range. And when we drilled into each of these stopovers that you see, um, we we built this greenness curve. And this is like, uh, we use satellites to basically look at how green uh, the earth is. And in this case, each habitat pixel in those stopovers. And so you can look at the peak green up, which is just, you know, the highest point. And then what we found is that the deer were, were never occupying the stopovers at peak green up. It was always like a month and a half earlier. And on average, across all the deer we looked at, deer use stopovers, 44 days prior to peak green up. So that looks like it's the, the, the period when, that, when, when there should be all those young emergent uh, plants. But this was kind of a clunk, clunky analysis. Um, then uh, along came these folks from Norway um, led by Richard Bischoff that published a paper in 2012 that kind of gave us a method to do this. And, and the details here aren't important, but basically, this biomass, that's the remote sensing, uh, we call this NDVI. So this is basically greenness that you see from space. So this curve we're all familiar with, it greens up in the spring and then it's super green in the summer and then it browns down again. And what, what Bischoff showed us is that you could just convert that, uh, that NDVI curve and um, take the derivative and it gives you this rate of this this rate of uh, the the highest rate of green up, so that's this point right here. So that's when the green up is occurring at its most rapid, and based on our idea of sort of early plant growth, that's if animals are surfing, that's when they should be occupying a given patch. 
So again, the details don't matter here, but this combined with the remote, remote sensing and a little math for every pixel, every place across these migrations, we can determine what is the day in which that pixel is at peak green up and the animals should be occupying it if they're surfing. And so uh, this allows us to look at when an animal is early, when they're late, and, and, and what an optimal surfer would do. If we were in person, this is where I would pause and, and look out and see if everybody's following me, but I'm just gonna assume that you are. Um, so in, uh, in, in the Norwegian example, they did this work with red deer, and interestingly, they found that red deer jump instead of surf. And what that basically means is they're on winter range, the green wave comes, pushes up to higher elevations, they let it pass them by, and then they jump up and catch up with it. But we had an idea that, you know, from our earlier work, that mule deer were perhaps actually surfing. And then I was fortunate to have uh, Ellen Akins join my lab. Um, she's since graduated and gone on to a faculty position at South Dakota State University and with USGS. And Ellen um, was excited to take on the task of, of doing all the GIS and all the analytical computations to figure out if those mule deer were actually surfing. And so uh, this work was done on the Wyoming range in Western Wyoming and the migration of mule deer you can see here in this little animation uh, going from winter range to summer range up in the mountains. And I'm gonna basically, so here I'm gonna show you how this, um, how the analysis works and how the migration works relative to the green wave. So this is going to be an animation and what we have are three, we have six animals, each one with a different color. When I start the man animation, they're just about to start migrating. It's the middle of March. They're gonna be migrating northward, but at the same time, the landscape is going to be greening up with that remote sense data. And, and this will allow you to see um, how they make their movements uh, relative to the green wave. And then, we'll, and then we'll quantify it after that. Okay, so here we are, we start the migration and you can see you know, some of the animals start migrating. These ones to the south have started migrating. Some haven't quite started yet, so there's some variability. Now you can see the whole basin has greened up, but these higher elevation mountains that they're going to have not greened up yet. Okay, so now they've been migrating for six weeks. And, and you can see some of them, they're kind of at this leading, they tend to be at this leading edge of the green wave. And they actually have another six weeks to go. Um, it's of course hard to see whether or not they're surfing uh, in, in this animation, but you can see they're, they're following that wave of green, green up up to their high elevation summer range. Okay, so now it's the, the end of May. So that was a two and a half month migration, right? And now we can ask, well, how well did they do? Were they surfing? And so basically here's the idea. We drill into, for every deer every day, we just drill in and remember, we know when that pixel was at its peak green up, so we can ask if they're ahead. Maybe this one looks like it's kind of behind. Perhaps this one was right surfing on that day. And then um, the metric we use is just the days from the peak IRG. IRG stands for instantaneous rate of green up, but it's basically the, the day that uh, that place, that, that pixel was at peak green up. And so obviously, when an animal is surfing, the days from peak is zero, right? And if it's ahead uh, or behind, the, the days from peak are 10 or 20 days, right? Okay, so, so that's the idea. And this is the test that Ellen put together. So she took all of the mule deer, all the days that they're migrating, and looked at, for every, every pixel that they occupied, looked at the date of the peak green up of that pixel, so when it should be at its peak and when the deer occupied it. And so the idea here is that if mule deer are surfing perfectly, all of their points should lie along this line, right? This one-to-one -one line, which means that they're occupying a, a pixel on the exact day that it's at peak green up. And, 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 and if they are doing that, that's, a, that's our test of what a theoretically perfect surfer would do. And what did the, the actual mule deer do? they were really good at this. And so here you can see their points line up, you know, they're not exactly one-to-one, -one, but they line up really well with that one-to-one -one line. So if there was no association here, if the animals were not surfing at all, 
this would just be a shotgun scatter across the whole graph, right? But what this indicates is that for two and a half months, by and large, these deer are always in the right place at the right time. Whenever they occupy one of those stopovers, they, they only occupy it as long as it's at peak green up. And then when the wave moves, they move with it. And so this is some of the strongest evidence for surfing. And, and we now think of this as, as, as one of the most important foraging benefits of migration because it allows animals to, to always get that early green uh, emergent uh, young forage. Okay, so um, interestingly, you know, we have those Norwegian red deer, which are appear to be jumpers. Mule deer are to date one of the best surfers that we have found, that anybody has found. And there's actually a lot of work to figure out, you know, where other ungulate taxa fall within this spectrum. And it turns out, um, I'm not going to dig into this, but we have done some work on this. One of the most important things is is the green wave itself. So some landscapes have green up that propagates across the landscape as a wave, and others the green up is much more homogeneous and, and there's no really wave that the animals can track. And it turns out this is really important for determining whether animals surf and whether or not they're migratory. So a lot more work to be done here, um, but we're starting to understand how to tie the animal behavior and their movements to this dynamic flux of, of their food resources. So um, we've also been very interested in understanding um, what the fitness benefits are of surfing. So basically, do animals that surf better put on more fat? Are they better able to rear young? Do they survive better? This is a hard question to get at, but we were able to evaluate this for an elk herd that um, winters outside of Yellowstone National Park, just east of Yellowstone National Park near the town of Cody. Um, you can see them in green here, and then they migrate up into Yellowstone National Park in the spring and summer. So we um, captured these animals and measured their body fat in September after they'd been migrating. And at the same time, here on the X, we, we scored how well they surfed. So over here, near the 15 are animals that surfed really well, just a couple weeks away from the green wave. And then we had other animals that were a month, five weeks away from the green wave. And then here on the Y is the amount of body fat they have in September. So they've migrated, they've been on summer range. And now we, now we ask, if you surf better, are you fatter? And as you can see from the graph, that is the case. And these are not subtle differences. The difference, uh, uh, an, an elk, that has a body fat of 20 to 22 uh, percent is you know, that's an elk that is going to survive the winter, uh, that's going to breed breed in the fall, survive the winter, and give birth to a, a high quality young. Whereas animals that are down here at eight to 10 percent in September, they may not breed, they may not survive the winter. If they breed and give birth, it might be a really um, uh, thin and, and um, not very viable young. So this is a really important um, metric of you know, the ability of these animals to survive uh, the winter conditions in the Rockies. Okay, so this work, uh, this notion of green wave surfing is really kind of changing the way we think about migration. We used to think that migration for ungulates at least was just about like, getting from winter range to summer range right, to get between those two seasonal ranges. But now we understand that that migration is itself a really important habitat. The corridor is a really important habitat because in the spring, that's when they're getting the best forage. And not only is it an important habitat, but it's also important that the animals choreograph their movements along the migration corridor so they can be in sync with the green up and get the best forage out of that habitat. Um, so now I'm going to switch to a different study. Um, this is work uh, that my colleague Hal Sawyer conducted down in a place called the Red Desert of, of south southwestern Wyoming. And this is this is work that when it started was um, was to study the movement patterns of a herd of resident mule deer mule deer that everybody thought lived year round in the Red Desert and didn't migrate. Well, Hall put out 
a bunch of collars and we got those collars back, he discovered that not only were those deer not resident, but they make the world's longest mule deer migration, um, 150 miles for one way from the Red Desert up into the, to the Hoback Basin, uh, the drainage of the Hoback River. And so this, um, I'm gonna talk about this migration a fair bit throughout the talk. It's been become kind of the poster child for thinking about the benefit, you know, why animals make these migrations, the benefits that they receive, the challenges that they face while they're migrating, and some of the opportunities that we have to conserve them. So we focused a lot on this 150 mile migration because it's just so impressive. Um, but there's actually three different strategies here. There's also um, medium distance migrants that just migrate up to the southern tip of the Wind River Range here. And then there's short distance migrants that basically stay year round in the desert. But importantly, they all, uh, you know, this time of year, they're all together on their winter range, which is just, which is concentrated down here. Um, and they're, and during winter range, that, so they basically, they all winter in the same place, but they summer in very different places. So this is a, a great opportunity to understand, like, obviously you can do these other things, um, you can just go 50 or 60 miles or 10 or 20 miles. So why go the whole 150 miles? Migration is kind of hard to do. So why make that long distance migration? Well, one of the things that we have been able to determine is that uh, the animals that make that long distance migra migration surf better. So these are the same plots that I showed you before. This is that one to one line. And here you can see um, the long distance migrants, their points fall, uh, they're, they're more aligned with the one one line than the medium distance or the short distance. So those long distance migrants are following that wave for 150 miles and they do a really good job at it. Well, what are the benefits of that? Well, I've also been working with my colleague, uh, Dr. Kevin Monteith, who's a professor here at the University of Wyoming. And we catch these animals twice a year. We catch them when they come out of the mountains and come down to the winter range in December. And we measure their, uh, Kevin uses an ultrasound to measure the amount of rump fat that they have um, on their back. And that's, that's basically their energy reserves that they're going into winter with. Then they're burning those reserves through winter and we catch them again in March and measure their rump fat again to see how much energy reserves they have left. And uh, we've been doing that for seven or eight years now. And this is the data uh, that we've got from that long-term study. So what you're seeing here is March and December captures of, of each year. And then on the Y is their percent body fat. So there's two primary things to see here. First is the seesaw pattern. So that was totally expected. What you're seeing there is that the peaks are in December. So the animals, go on their spring migration, go up to summer range, and then the snow hits and they come back to winter range and we measure their body fat. They've just completed their migration, so they're fat and happy. They've, they've been converting all those young plants to fat uh, and they're at their fattest state. Then you see these troughs and that trough is in, in March. Um, in fact, we just did this capture a couple weeks ago. And so, that's the decline that you see over winter during because over winter those animals are burning that fat and in March the differences are kind of subtle but they're actually really important very small differences in the amount of body fat that these animals can have in March late winter can determine whether or not they they starve to death and make it through winter so uh, then the other thing is to see the three different colors so purple is the long distance migration medium is in orange and the short distance are in green. And so every year, the long distance migration migrants put on much more fat than the other two strategies. And so, um, so again, that fat determines how well these animals breed, whether they have, uh, a, whether they're pregnant or not, or they have singletons or twins uh, and their overwinter survival. And so we see that this is a really great example of the, the benefit of making that 150 mile migration. And not surprisingly, when we catch these animals on winter range, there are 10 times more long distance migrants as there are short distance migrants. 
and half as many medium distance migrants. So it's very clear that the long distance migration is the more profitable strategy. So we've been um, continuing to study this herd. Um, is, we're interested in looking at the long-term patterns of these three strategies. And in 2016, we put out uh, a new batch of collars catching animals down here on the winter range. And these, these collars have uh, a GPS, but also a satellite uplink, which allows us to watch their migration like daily on our computer. And so we put out the collars in the spring, and then we're watching their migration. And this one animal caught our attention and this is deer number 255. So she made the long distance migration like many other animals that we've collared have done, but she didn't stop there for summer range like the other animals do, she kept going. She went around the Grovant Mountains, down into Jackson Hole, around Jackson Lake, around the northern foothills of the Tetons to Island Park, Idaho. So whereas the rest of the herd migrates 150 miles, she moved 240 miles. And so this was really exciting. Again, we're sort of watching it on our computers throughout the spring and summer. And there were two options here. Either this is her migration and she just beat the record um, by 90 miles, or uh, this is a dispersal. Like she fell in the wrong with the wrong crowd and now she's gone to Idaho and she ain't coming back. And we knew that all we had to do was just wait until uh, the fall and early winter came to see if she would come all the way, if this is her migration and if she would come all the way back to the Red Desert. Well, then uh, her collar malfunctioned in like August of, uh, of 2016. And this here's a picture of my PhD student, Anna Ortega, who for the next year and a half you know, listened far and wide for the signal of, of um, Deer 255's collar, but she was completely lost to us. Her, her radio signal didn't work, her GPS didn't work, her satellite uplink didn't work. We couldn't find, we had no idea where she was. We, had, um, we couldn't hear her or have any way of tracking her. Until um, in March, late winter of 2018, we were once again catching animals on the Red Desert Winter Range and the helicopter crew just happened to catch an animal that had an old, older collar on it and bring it in to us. And uh, Anna knew is me immediately when she saw the serial number on the collar that that was deer 255. So two years later, she had made it all the way back to winter range. And we put a fresh GPS collar on her, a new GPS collar to see if she would make this return migration. And we've been tracking her ever since, and I'm gonna show you those, but before I do that, I wanna just take a little detour into um, trying to understand how these animals learn to make these migrations. So, uh, you know, 200, going 240 miles, uh, you know, finding your way across the vast wild landscape for 240 miles is, is a very difficult task, um, you know, I get lost in big cities and I'm only moving a couple miles. Um, so the idea, so these animals have great navigational abilities. And the idea is that across migratory taxa, their navigation abilities are either innate or learned. And if they're innate, that means that they're genetically programmed. And a lot of um, migratory birds have genetic programs that help them know when to migrate and even the direction to migrate. But in mammals, it's thought that these migrations need to be learned, but there's never been a really good test of this idea. And a former PhD student of mine, Brett Jesmer, realized that with the translocations of bighorn sheep, there was an opportunity to test this idea. So as many of you know, when the West was settled, um, we basically eradicated bighorn sheep. And uh, through a variety of overhunting disease with domestics, but for 70 years, there's been, an, there's been a massive conservation effort to restore bighorn sheep to their former range. And a lot of these translocations have been taking bighorn sheep from natal ranges where they are migratory and translocating them into new hab novel habitats to them that were historical habitats, but novel habitats to them. And so Brett realized that 
this was an opportunity to see if the animals would, would migrate in their new habitat. There were also some moose that um, recolonized, which he could incorporate into this analysis as well. So oftentimes when the bighorn sheep are translocated, they were released into the new habitat with GPS collars. So it was just a matter of looking at the movement tracks of those animals and see if they're migratory in their new range. And the answer to that is very simple, that no, they are not migratory. And so here, um, this is kind of a time since translocation of many different populations of bighorn sheep uh, in orange and moose in purple. And here are all the just translocated herds. So when animals are newly translocated, even if they're migratory in their natal habitat, when they're newly translocated in a new habitat that's novel to them, they do not migrate. Um, but we also have data for animals that have been in those landscapes for 30, 60, even even 90 or years or a century. And then over here on this end are bighorn sheep that never lost, that never were extirpated, that were have always existed in their habitats. And for those, you see they're nearly 100% migratory. But in between, you can see it, and there's a bit of noise here, of course, but in between, you can see that this is the animals learning how to migrate across generations right? Many generations. Um, so there's kind of, this is a bit of a hopeful message that yes, the animals can learn how to migrate given enough time, but in the case of moose, it takes nearly a century for them to learn how to migrate. Um, so this is also a cautionary tale because um, do we have a century or do we have 30 or 40 years uh, to restore a population if it loses its migration? So um, this was a really important study um, pointing to this importance of learning. And it's actually a type of, um, we, we think of this now as an actual, a type of animal culture, right? It's not genetic, it's learned, it's passed on from generation to generation. And um, when this study came out, it was covered by uh, Ed Yong, the science writer. And I really like this headline, humans are destroying animals ancestral knowledge. I like it because it's clever and also misleading. And it's misleading in the sense that we are not now destroying animals' ancestral knowledge, right? Across the West, across Wyoming, across the West, many of these migrations still exist and the knowledge is still intact. But that is exactly the way we should be thinking about you know, what happens when you lose a migratory herd. So with bighorn sheep, when they were extirpated in the West, we think about the millions of animals that were lost, but we should also be thinking about all of the collective knowledge about how to migrate and make a living on these landscapes that was also lost and is now slowly being regained. Uh, and although we're not destroying the ancestral knowledge of these herds right now, uh, in many places as these, pla as these habitats become more fragmented, fragmented that's uh, a likely outcome if we don't manage the herds and their migrations. Okay, so um, oh, so back to deer 255. So she's got a fresh collar on. It's now the spring of 2018, and we can look at uh, whether she goes back to Island Park. And uh, here's the migration she made in spring of 2018. She basically followed, walked in her very same footsteps all the way back to Island Park. In the following fall of 2018, she came all the way back to the Red Desert. We've been tracking her since um, in, this, in, in 2019. She only made it just south of Moran Junction near Grand Teton in summer to, to, and then back to Red Desert. In 20, she made it just to the no north of the Grand Tetons. In summer 21, she, she was just north of the lake. She's currently down back down on her winter range. Um, last we checked in with her, she has twins um, that have made it through the winter so far. So we'll see if, if those animals migrate with her uh, back to Island Park this year. And uh, there's Deer 255 with her twins in the fall on their way down to Winter Range. Okay, so, um, so to kind of take a, a quick summary here, oh, I'm gonna try to, there we go. Um, 
what what we've learned so far is that when we think about these migrations, um, these are movements that have been honed over generations. And I like to think of this as, as a choreography. These animals have figured out how to choreo choreograph their movements in the spring to follow the green wave, in the, in the winter to follow uh, the snow melt. They're, they've figured out how to be in tune with the changing dynamics. And that's part of their migration and part of how they uh, derive that benefit. So um, the, the animals have a more intimate knowledge of the landscapes than I think we've previously uh, understood or appreciated. But of course, now many of those landscapes are changing. And um, a, another segment of our research program has been to try to understand what are the consequences of fences and roads and developments that are popping up in the middle of these uh, migration corridors. One of the most important developments uh, or sources of disturbance uh, in Wyoming and other parts of the West is energy development. And um, this is happening in, in our sagebrush basins. And oftentimes, uh, sometimes these are right in the middle of the migration corridors. So the question has been, if we have this type of energy development in the middle of the corridors, how do the migrating animals respond? And in particular, you know, does this disrupt their ability to surf the green wave? So um, we've, we've shown before that when animals um, encounter disturbance, sometimes they slow down, sometimes they speed up, sometimes they detour around. And the question that we've been wanting to answer for a long time is, does that disrupt their ability to surf and thereby reduce the, the, the profitability of, 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 of making these migrations and getting all that fresh forage. So we've had an opportunity recently to um, answer that question. And this is work of my former master's student, Teal Wyckoff. So this is a mule deer migration that happens to go uh, right through this dry cow creek development area, which was being drilled for um, deep natural gas or coal bed um, methane. And we happen to have collars uh, monitoring this herd throughout the development, as you can see here in these panels, um, since it developed from two of 2005 with just hardly a few well pads through to 2008 and 2014. And so we could ask, you know, did this, when, as this field was developed, did this disrupt their ability to surf the green wave? And so here's, um, here's the way I'm going to show you this, and it's, um, it, this graph is maybe a little bit complicated, but I think it's not too difficult to follow. So basically on the left side here is winter range. So these animals start their migration and on the right side is their summer range. And these bins is just how much time they spend at each mile marker. And so, which, and then here at, at zero is the energy field, the oil and gas field. And so what you can see is that there's a clear pattern that as these animals, even in the low development phase in the early years, right as they get to the energy field, they stop over. They spend a lot, they hold up, and they spend a lot of time uh, just sort of waiting. Then they zip across and, and slowly make their way to summer range. And you can see that even as the, as the well, as the energy development area continues to expand and intensify, they hold up and then they rush through and finally get to summer range. And again, in the high development, I think it's even more pronounced. You can see the holding up pattern and then they're kind of, they're, they're, they're sort of rushing through. Um, they're, you know, they're spending less time and then finally getting you know, to their summer range. So it's clear that there's a disruption to their, to their movement, to their speed. And the question is, does that, relate to a disruption in their surfing ability. So to look at that, I'm going to show you the, the, the graphs that you're hopefully familiar with of the days from peak. But now I've calculated their surfing at every mile marker. So if you look at the low development, they're actually doing pretty good. So here, this zero is zero days from peak. So that's perfect surfing, right? Along, so as they go from winter range to summer range, they're, do, you know, they're doing pretty good of, of staying in pace with the green wave when development is low. But then in the 
min medium development. Look here, here you can see the pattern of that holding up. So they basically, they're slow to start migrating and they get to the energy development field. And basically what's happening here is they're migrating, they get to the field, they stop over, and they basically let the wave pass them by, right? The wave passes them by and then eventually they go through and and now they're and now they're late, right? And they're they they spend the rest of the migration trying to catch up. And there's no habituation here either. Even at the high development, um, they're late when they start, and then they've got to rush to try to catch up. So clear pattern here that they're getting um, mismatched from the green wave because of that holding up behavior, and then they're trying to catch up with it. And this is kind of a long-term data set, 10 or 12 years. And we look at just days from peak, how well did they did overall during their migration across the years that this energy field has been developing. Uh, you can see that, so this is increasing. That means they're getting further and further mismatched. So this is pretty strong evidence, the best evidence we have so far that this type of energy development, when it occurs in the middle of their migration corridors, basically disrupts their ability to surf the green wave. And I think this is a really important uh, finding because it suggests, I think this is how you lose migrations, right? It's not that we put a fence or a road and we just sever the migration and the animals show up one day and they can't get through. That's not how it happens. It, it happens like this. We, it's like death by a, a thousand cuts, right? We, we keep making th this migration more and more difficult and less and less profitable until eventually the animals that are still making it, you know, can't make a good living, can't reproduce as well, and can't can't replenish the population numbers, and then the population just declines and 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 blinks out. Um, so, so we need to, you know, we don't know where the threshold levels of development are, where the tipping points are, but I think there's a clear mechanism for how development and other disturbances can. Uh, alter the ability of animals to surf the green wave and get the profit, get the benefits from these migrations in terms of their foraging quality. So um, this is, comes with a recognition that, you know, we still have a lot of intact migrations across the Western United States, but we're making them more difficult. And, um, and so we need to think about, you know, how do we sustain these migrations? How do we how do we manage these migrations into the future so that we can maintain our migratory herds? And with these ideas in mind, uh, in 2012, we created the Wyoming Migration Initiative. And you can see our mission statement here. Um, but essentially, the goal of, of this initiative was to make better maps of the migrations so that we could understand the threats and advance conservation. And so we've done a lot of work with cartographers at the University of Oregon. Most of the maps that have been in my talk were produced by my colleagues uh, who are professional cartographers at the University of Oregon. And this has just been a great collaboration to help visualize the migration, visualize the threats, visualize what these animals are going through. Um, and then one of the first things we did when we created the, my, the Wyoming migration issues was come back to the Red Desert to Hoback migration. And now we looked at it this way through land ownership. And you can see some of the complexities. These animals, as they migrate this 150 miles, they cross lands that are managed by uh, two different federal agencies, two different state agencies. They go in and out of 40 different private uh, property uh, parcels. Um, and so this is a really complicated landscape for these migrations to continue into the future. And it's difficult. Um, uh, is that not going? There we go. Um, so as these animals migrate, they have to, um, during their spring migration, they have to cross these swollen rivers um, and other lake outlets. And um, there's three or four different uh, river crossings that they have to cross. There's three to four different highways, depending on their, their route that they have to cross, and um, 100 different fences. And in working with our partners uh, at the Bureau of Land Management and the Wyoming Game and Fish Department, we, were, we realized that we didn't have a good handle on uh, where, in particular, and specifically, 
we needed to keep these landscapes open to, to assure that these migrations continue. continue. And, that, and that was basically because uh, we didn't have good maps. We didn't have actionable maps of the migrations. And we have what, what you see here, which I refer to as sort of like the spaghetti line maps. This is just the download off of the collar connecting the points and you see all these spaghetti lines. Um, but each of those spaghetti lines, you don't know, you know, is it 10 meters wide or is it a kilometer or 10 kilometers wide? And so um, we developed some statistical analyses to basically put some width to those and, and sum them up across the whole population into this kind of heat map. And what you see in the heat map is, is this varies by, by use. And so these high use are segments of the corridor that are used by a very large proportion of the animals. You can sort of think of these as like the interstates and then these, these yellow ones might be, you know, the highways or county roads that only a few animals are using. So obviously these high use corridors are the places that we need to keep open uh, for the movement of the most of the largest number of animals in the herd. And in fact, in Wyoming, it was this, this type of analysis that led to a map of the of and the designation of the of the Red Desert to Hoback Migration Corridor, which is basically a way for the state wildlife agencies to to get this corridor on the books and then into the public planning process on 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 federal lands. Once we map this migration, we also uh, realized could have easily evaluate some of the threats. And the top threat to this migration is this Fremont Lake bottleneck. And this is a place where you can see in this inset here where at this point, four to 5,000 animals squeezed between a quarter mile bottleneck between the growing town of Pinedale and Fremont Lake, this deep glacial lake. And here you can see the animals um, swimming the outlet of the lake during their spring migration. And this was complicated by the fact that just down river of here um, is a fence that borders a private piece of property which is up for sale and slated for lakeside cottages. And um, that 360 acre parcel can be seen here and up here. And when we mapped this migration, uh, we learned that that parcel was up for sale and to be subdivided into lakeside cottages that would have literally just plugged up the migration. Uh, but with the map in place and recognizing the importance that, that the animals be able to continue to move through this bottleneck each spring and fall, the Conservation Fund raised $2 million to purchase that property and convert it to a wildlife habitat management area. They took down the problematic fences and, and opened up that, uh, that bottleneck for specifically for this migratory herd. So this is an example of some of the really targeted conservation measures that are possible when you have really detailed maps of these migrations and you, you know where the animals need to go and where the problem spots are. Also, um, this is a, a migration that has a fair bit of energy development in the, in the sagebrush basin down near the Red Desert. Um, these are existing oil and gas leases in blue and proposed ones in yellow. Um, what um, we also, what, what I, what looks like it didn't make it out of this map is that um, because this was mapped, because this corridor was mapped and designated by the state in 2018 and 2019, and at least 24,000 acres of oil and gas leasings were deferred, um, not sold because they overlapped too closely with the corridor and, and, were, and were viewed by the state and by the Department of Interior as being uh, too high of risk to the functionality of the corridor. So this type of mapping you know, can guide how we plan for these things on, on federal lands. Okay, so um, then in 2018, I'm sort of scaling up now. In 2018, uh, then Secretary of Interior Ryan Zinke signed a secretarial order 3362 which called on USGS to work with Western states to map their corridors. Um, and I was tasked with sort of leading this effort. And so we, we put together uh, something we call the corridor mapping team. And you can see we've been meeting remotely since early 2019. And we, and we now have representatives from all the Western states from several different tribes. And basically the goal of this team is to um, get together and share technical expertise and work 
to help states map their migration corridors. And that's the that's the sole purpose is to get there's a lot of GPS data that already exists. The state wildlife agencies have have really led on collecting the data and now through this team and most of the state agencies have their staff these a lot of these are state biologists who are participating on this team and together we work to um, to, to map the migration corridors of individual herds across uh, these different states and tribes. So here's where here's our sort of current map for Wyoming. You can see the red desert to Hoback here in purple, uh, but there's lots of other migrations that we've mapped of mule deer and pronghorn and elk, which are in green and moose in yellow. Um, so we, we've got a good jump on it. Uh, when we look across the west, this is this is the picture. We're, you know, we're starting to fill it in. We've now, uh, we've published one volume of these migration maps in November of 2020. Uh, the second volume we're proofing right now and will be published in early April. Um, you know, we're, we're starting to get to fill out the map of the Western United States, but there's still some holes. And, and I wanna stress that in a lot of cases where there are holes, it doesn't mean that there aren't migratory herds there. It just means that either that data hasn't been shared with this effort yet, or those animals haven't been collared. Um, but hopefully over the next three to five years, you know, we'll be able to flesh out and, and um, develop a complete inventory of the migrations across the Western US. So I wanna end by um, returning to those pronghorn that I showed you migrating out of Grand Teton. Um, that was their fall migration going down to the Pinedale Winter Range. That's a difficult migration, as this photo shows. This is animals um, in 2010 during, uh, during their fall migration. 2010 was a particularly um, early winter, and these animals have to judge it right when, when to make that migration. And that year, they kind of judged it wrong and ended up having to plow through a lot of chest deep snow. They suffered high mortality. And so after they've gone through the mountains, they come down, um, um, when they're almost to the winter range, they have to cross Highway 189, which um, is, a, is a highway that has increasing traffic levels on it and where a lot of animals used to get killed on the road um, with vehicle collisions. But because there was a detailed map of this migration, um, the, the Wyoming Game and Fish Department and the and the Wyoming Department of Transportation recognized that all of those uh, carcasses were piling up on the road and the vehicle collisions were stacking up on the road right where the pronghorn would migrate and come across it each spring and fall. And so they um, used that information to uh, cite an overpass. And here is a video of these animals um, one of the first groups of pronghorn coming down out of the mountains uh, in 2012, encountering that overpass and, and crossing it for the first time. So the pronghorn were really, it only took them a couple of weeks to sort of figure out um, what these overpasses were all about. They know where they're going to, they're heading to their winter range, which is just now a few miles away. There's one mule deer in there that I don't know what she's doing. So um, I like to show this video because I think it it illustrates what I think is the hope for uh, conserving these migrations. We have the science to understand where these animals migrate and how they do it and where they need to go. And we actually have a lot of tools in the toolbox like overpasses and underpasses and fence modifications and conservation easements and many other things that if, if we use the science appropriately, we can use those tools to keep these migrations open and sustain these migratory herds into the future. So that's it. Um, I'm just going to leave my acknowledgement slide up here, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you all might have. Thank you. All right. All right. Thank you Thank so you much, so much Matt. Matt. That was fantastic. Um, we are now open, like you said, those Q&A mm -hmm portion of the lecture and we've been monitoring all the questions that have come through so far and we'll go ahead and I'll ask those out loud first. Uh, please be aware that we might not be able to get to every single one, but we'll start best.
Um, again, if you want to submit a question, remember to click on the question mark uh, mark icon on the upper right hand corner of your screen. All right, so our first question we have from Madison. She says, so in one of the recent pictures of the trail they take, do they think they always take this trail? Maybe they remember the green from the years before. In other words, do they take the same trail because they remember the green was beneficial to them in other years rather than switching up trails? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, what we have found, well, it varies by species, but to start with mule deer first, which are the um, most, the best well-behaved ungulate in the American West. Um, mule deer have super high fidelity to their trails, to that, to that migration route, to their individual routes. And like on that 150 mile migration, we've looked at individuals, you know, in spring and the fall and the subsequent years, they're about 300 meters within the route that they took the year before. Um, and, but with respect to the green up, what we see is that they have really high fidelity, spatial fidelity to that route, but they don't have high temporal fidelity. So one year, if the green up comes late, they might migrate a month later because they're staying in sync with that green up. Um, same way in the fall, they when if the snow comes late or early, that might force them to migrate early or late out of the mountains. So they're going to use, with mule deer, they're going to use that same migration route in most cases, but it's just but the timing, they'll, use, they'll differ the timing in order to uh, stay in sync with the green up or the snow melt. Um, and then other species are messier, like pronghorn um, uh, don't have the same level of fidelity. They, some, they, they, they use uh, different routes in different years. Um, uh, some pronghorn populations uh, across the West are actually nomadic, meaning that they don't really return to the same places year after year. Um, elk are somewhere in the middle. Some of them have really high fidelity. Others tend to tend to um, vary a bit from year to year. So, um, but I do think they I do think they have both knowledge of the route. I do think they have knowledge of the green up. Right, they have knowledge of. Um, when it's an early year, when it's a late year. Um, we actually have some work that we're just finishing up right now that that indicates that um, and it's on this 150 mile migration. It indicates that they know where they are relative to the wave. And if they are behind it, they speed up to catch it. And if they are ahead of it, they stop over to let the wave catch them. And so they they seem to have a lot of knowledge about not only just spatially where the route is, but also temporally whether they're ahead or behind the wave. OK. Let's see here. We have someone who had asked, um, just if I missed this, but how many animals do you have these tracking devices on? Mm, that's a good question. I don't really know the answer. Um, I'd have to like start doing some doodling here. Um, let's see, I guess, um, so for my, the studies that I'm conducting, we have, um, we often shoot for 40 or 50 animals um, within a herd. And, and we find we, that that sample size is adequate to allow us to map their migrations. Um, in the Red Desert, we have about 100 animals collared. Um, I'd say right now, just off the top of my head, we probably have three to 400 animals collared in Wyoming from my studies. And then there are other researchers who probably have another three to 400. Um, some of the, and, and uh, other states in the West, like Colorado, I think they often have about a thousand mule deer collared per year. Um, so it's a it's it's a pretty sizable effort, and uh, 
as the cost of the collars and the captures are coming down, it allows us to get larger sample sizes to, to monitor these herds. Okay. Um, Virginia asks, oh, first she has a, also she had a comment. Great photos of the animals. Um, she wants to know, how do you protect yourselves from the ticks that these deer generally carry? Mm, that's really not something that we worry about. Um, um, we've never had any transmission of ticks to our capture crews uh, that we know of. Um, we have actually been pretty concerned recently of the potential transmission of COVID. Um, as so some of you will probably know that there's COVID has been found in white-tailed deer. Uh, we don't know if it's in mule deer yet, but um, we've we use masks and, and gloves when we're handling these animals to prevent the potential transmission of any COVID positive crew members to the deer. But yeah, ticks we have that hasn't been a problem. Okay. Um, someone wants to know: Are there any migratory herds left in the eastern United States? I don't. I don't really know. Uh, okay. Yeah, most of the ungulates in the eastern uh, U.S. Uh, are white tails. Of course, when you get into New England, you get moose. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if if there are some smaller migrations in the east, uh, especially in the northeast. But I haven't seen maps of any of them. All right. Let's see here. Um, do you ever run into resistance from local communities when installing wildlife crossing structures? If so, how do you approach it? I noticed that I noticed what looked like a private home in the background of the last pronghorn overpass video. Um, yeah, so I mean, like our work, I mean, we're we're doing the research and the mapping and the collaring, but you know, um, the work of putting the overpasses that always falls to the Department of Transportation, often uh, conducted in collaboration with the state wildlife agency in Wyoming. That's the Wyoming Game and Fish Department. Um, so I'm not terribly familiar with those negotiations, but I can tell you that you know oftentimes um, we try to figure out, and you don't want to just willy nilly put up an overpass. They're very expensive, multi-million dollars. You don't want to just willy-nilly put them up where it's convenient to put them. You want to put them where the animals will use them. And in, in a lot of the cases, we already, you know, we have the mapped migration and then that and that overpass that I showed, you know, we already knew where the migration was. And so they put the overpass right in the middle where the animals were already crossing the road. So so the animal's behavior dictates and their migration patterns dictates where the overpass or underpass should be. And if it happens to be private land on either side of the highway there, then they have to work with that private landowner and try to get some type of easement on that land, um, which usually can be can be purchased if the if the landowner is willing. Um, sometimes the landowners aren't willing to um, participate in those. And so, you know, that that uh, precludes putting um, crossing structures in some places. Okay. Uh, Madison wants to know, do people, obviously people, she puts in prints, take advantage of knowing these migration paths by intentionally killing, illegally hunting them for themselves? In the path that was built over the highway, obviously residents know it was built as a migration route. So maybe greedy residents take advantage of knowing their path and hunt them for whatever reason. Yeah, so um, that's that's always that comes up as a concern. Uh, we hear that from the public. Um, however, um, I feel like um, I mean, you're you're basically balancing different things. So on on the one hand. Um, these herds have been hunted for thousands of years, right? In fact, 
Um, where I show that overpass is a um, is is a place called Trappers Point. It's an archaeological site, and uh, when they were when they were widening the highway in the early 1990s, they had to do an archaeological dig there, and they discovered that that was a big game ambushing site, uh, and which dates back uh, five to eight thousand years. And it's actually it's a it's a neat story because it indicates that that bottleneck probably existed, you know, five to eight thousand years ago, and early humans would it was a reliable place for early humans to to ambush pronghorn. Um, and they could even identify the, that a lot of the uh, the animals had fetal bones that indicated that it was probably during the spring migration when they were being hunted. So, so humans have followed these migrations and lived off them, you know, um, for a very long time. And of course now, you know, hunting is regulated, um, poaching is tightly uh, policed. And so the the risk that someone uh, would use one of these would use these maps to poach an animal, I think, is pretty low. But at the same time, to me, that is vastly outweighed by the benefits of mapping these migrations. Because um, if you know you take that Fremont Lake bottleneck, if that bottleneck had been developed and in, into lakeside cottages. Um, the impact would not have been to one animal that was poached. It would have been to thousands of animals that no longer could make that um, migration. So my feeling is that is um, the American West is growing. If we're going to sustain these migrations, we have to map them. We have to understand where these animals need to go, and we have to manage and um, conserve these landscapes and maintain that connectivity in order to sustain the herds. And the benefit of do of being able to have that work be guided by science and by mapping vastly outweighs uh, what I think is a really small risk of of any um, you know bad actors using the maps um, you know to poach an animal. Uh, the last thing I'll say is that we have all these maps ourselves, and even when we need to go out and find a specific animal like deer two fifty five. It takes a lot of work to find them, and that's when we have the maps and we have telemetry and everything else. So, um, even when even when you know that they use a mile wide corridor, it's really hard to find the animals. Okay. Have a few here from Joe. Says hello, Mr. Matt. How do I take this exam? Also, where are the fish dying? I don't remember you talking about fish, but. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I talked about fish. So um, yeah, I don't know. I don't have an answer to that question. Um, maybe Joe. OK. Can, uh, clarify his question in the in the chat there. Sure. He also wants to know why is global warming such a hot topic? It's all liberal lies, he says. Not sure. Touch on that. Um, yeah, so uh, I didn't talk about climate change, but um, it's become increasingly clear that, uh, you know, I, I did talk about surfing the green wave, right? And um, we've been really interested in trying to understand, you know, what long term drought does to the green wave. And of course, droughts are getting longer, more intense because of climate change. And what we find with mule deer is that. Um, a drought in in drought years, the green wave is harder to surf. And and basically, um, the way to think about that is that when it's not a drought year, when it's cool and and it's rainy in the spring and the summer, the wave moves slowly uh, as as things are greening up. It moves slowly across the landscapes and the animals can, and and it, and it and it moves in a coordinated wave-like fashion. During drought years, um, the wave is much more heterogeneous and it's it's much more rapid, so it's harder for the animals um, to track the green wave during drought years. So it's, 
I mean, ungulate managers and researchers have known that drought reduces the forage benefit of um, for you know for migratory big game and non-migratory big game you know during the growing season, and um, we're starting to see that one of the mechanisms of that is that it makes it harder for them to serve. Okay. Jason asks, the hesitation near oil and gas development that you showed, what is your hypothesis as to why they hesitate there? If it is roads or structures, would they maybe hesitate similarly in wind farm fields, which also have a lot of roads and of course structures? Yeah, so I think the um, there's been a lot of work looking at disturbance on winter range and and in on on all sorts of seasonal ranges for for big game and for other wildlife. And what you commonly see is that animals avoid humans. And so on winter range, when the animals are sort of sedentary, uh, what you see is they basically don't use or don't use as much the, the, the parts of their habitat of their winter range that are close to energy development, right? They, they, they give humans and that traffic and it's really the activity, uh, they give that activity a wide berth. Um, but then when you think about migration, you have, I think what's going on is like, it's not as simple for them to avoid the humans when they're migrating because they need to get through, right? And so, um, I think this is, but it's sort of in line with, with the way we understand wildlife to respond to human disturbance. In this case, they do have a task to get through and get to summer range. And so I think the way they, it's basically a, a manifestation of their avoidance. So they first avoid, you know, and that's the holding up behavior, but then eventually, you know, they need to get on with their migration. And then, and then we, we do see that they, when they go through, they're moving more quickly than 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 they were prior to the development, and so they avoid and then go through. and And so I think it's basically a type of avoidance behavior um, that allows them to continue on with their migration, although it gets them mismatched with the green wave, as I discussed. Um, there are some um, so with respect to wind, uh, and we can think about solar too. Um, wind energy. So the thing that is really clear with energy development is it's really the human activity. So it's not the well pads per se, it's the amount of traffic and human activity and the frequency of that traffic that the animals are responding to. So anything you can do on, on oil and gas fields to reduce the human activity, um, then, then you see less avoidance by, by mule deer in particular. Um, there's a number of studies that are ongoing with wind development. Uh, I'm involved with one on pronghorn. Some of my colleagues are involved with one on mule deer. Um, I Those studies haven't come in yet. They're not finished, but um, my guess is that we're going to see less avoidance of wind than we see of oil and gas because because there's just there's less of a there's less human activity associated with wind development um, because once the turbines are erected, then it, then um, there's just you know one one person driving around doing uh, taking some measurements and tuning them up, tuning the turbines up. Um, but the jury's still kind of out to on on what the effect of wind development will be on uh, on ungulates. And um, there is some work. Uh, there is some new work that a colleague of mine, Paul Sawyer, who I've mentioned, has done on solar development, and that's kind of it's it's a different thing as well with solar they're often completely fenced out so they're not permeable at all because they don't want animals to disturb the the panels and so that you know that is a removal of the habitat um, and we're still trying to understand you know if there are better designs uh, for solar installations that will minimize the impact to um, migrating animals okay Virginia wants to know, do you have any information on how any of these animals deal with deal with disasters such as flood or fire? Um, yeah, we um, well, 
we have some we have some information. Um, I mean, I guess the first thing to say is that things that we think of as disasters might not be disastrous for you know these wild animals. Um, I think with floods, you know, that those might that might not be an issue for them. If um, obviously if it ends up washing out some part of of their route, you know, they're pretty adapted at moving around it. Fire is actually um, which can be disastrous for you know human communities. Actually, can be restorative for wildlife habitat. And um, there was actually a big fire up in the summer range of the Red Desert to Hoback migration. And we have before and after data, and it shows pretty clearly that after the fire came through, uh, in the years subsequent to that, the animals increased their use of the burnt areas uh, because, because it stimulated uh, more undergrowth. Um, so there's better forage after the fire. Um, and actually fire is used to, to restore wildlife habitat in a lot of parts of the West. Um, so yeah, we don't, but we don't really have any examples of what I would call it, you know, a, a natural disaster that has happened for her that we've been monitoring that allows us to like look at, look um, directly at their response. Okay. We have a few more minutes to answer a couple of qu more questions here. Um, Linda wants to know, do you ever examine ungulate faunal collections from archaeological sites to look at migratory or climate change over time? Um, our group has not. Um, one thing that we, um, we, ha we, we haven't, but there is, um, there is some work that we've been wanting to do. Um, um, and I'll just mention that um, ecologists have have um, figured out how to um, evaluate isotopes that, um, for example, strontium isotopes, which replaces for calcium in and basically is a reliable signature of the landscape that animals move through. And so um, we've done a little work to um, try to try to reveal the temporal signature of strontium isotope in the teeth of, of mule deer and moose and elk. Um, ultimately, um, we, we kind of never ended up getting funding for this, but ultimately what we're interested in is trying to um, recreate some of the migratory patterns of um, like not necessarily paleo migrations, but even migrations 200 or years ago or pre-settlement would be really interesting because we just know ne next to nothing about uh, how those animals were migrating before the West was settled. Okay. Wayne wants to know, at the place where the oiled field is, would it be useful for a team to harass the herd to speed them up to keep them up with the green wave? Obviously, it would have to be done annually. Yeah, I, I hadn't ever thought about that. Um, and I don't know that it would be possible, um, at least with mule deer, um, they're really hard, like, it's hard to control. Like, you know, you'd be trying to get them to go one direction and it's really hard to, to control which way they will go when you walk in on them. Um, but, but, you know, and then of course that that approach also, you know, risks um, them associating the, you know, the, they, they might they may end up associating the the oil field with human disturbance, and you know, for lots of the for a lot of the development that we see in Wyoming, they are they're not impermeable. They're they're semi permeable. Like the animals can get through them, and we want them to get through them so that they can continue on with their migration. Um, so, yeah, I think I think I would be a little concerned of you know creating a reaction that you can't really control. Um, yeah. Okay. Well. 
that with the uh, public here. Madison says, thank you for your presentation and knowledge, Matt. This is very interesting, and I'm interested in seeing how the tracking will continue on. Thank you. Someone else commented, great talk, very informative. Thank you, Matt. Great. And yes, thank you so much, Matt, for your talk today and for answering the questions from our audience. I also want to thank all of you for joining us. Matt's lecture will be available for on-demand viewing in about a week on our website at www.usgs.gov forward slash PLS. Also, if you'd like to be part of our monthly mailing list, feel free to send us an email at WMC ESIC at USGS.gov, which is listed on the screen. And please join us again on April 28th at 6 p.m. Pacific time for Justin Welty's talk on a burning question, what can long-term data sets teach us? We will see you next time. Good night. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody.